Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 51, the Comedian You Should Know special. This is an all stand-up comedy special recorded at Meltdown Comics on December 15th, 2010. Uh, it's going to be our last episode of 2010. We will be back regular schedule in 2011, so please don't worry. Uh, you weren't worried, were you? Nah, you're probably not worried. You seem fine. Uh, a few people to thank, of course, Meltdown Comics on Sunset Boulevard. Thank you so much for uh, giving us the space. Also... Jonah Ray, who co-produces the Meltdown show, the weekly Wednesday night show at Meltdown Comics with Kamel Nanjani, and also a huge special thanks to Emily Gordon, who, without her, I mean, like, she was the, she was the champion producer that really helped pull this all together, so thanks to her as well. Uh, and here you go, the Nerdist Podcast number 51, Comedians You Should Know, exclamation point. Now entering... Nerdist.com All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to Nerdist Podcast, presenting... Comics You Should Know live at Meltdown Comics. Everyone, welcome your host, Chris Hardwick. Thank you, Ed Salazar. Thank you. Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast, Comedians You Should Know special. Thank you for coming, you guys. This was... That was... I, I wanted to do this show because when I was a kid, I was very heavily influenced. I mean, in the in the '80s comedy boom, just try to try to fucking get away from stand up on television. You couldn't. So uh, I watched every special. I consumed every. Uh, thanks for the water, Ed. Uh, well, that's not going to help the people listening to the podcast. Why would I refer to things that they can't see with their? You can't see with your ear holes. That's not how those work. Unless you're synesthetic. That's the term for when your senses cross over. I know things. Science channel. All right. um, So I was so heavily influenced by young comedian specials where, like, you know, every every year Dangerfield would do one. There were, you know, there was they 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 would always introduce you to the ninth annual young comedian special. I had videotaped it and I I literally watched it every day for like a year straight. But it was uh, Rodney Dangerfield hosted. Regis Philbin was on the show as well, but. (laughs) For some reason, he wasn't doing comedy. I don't know why he was there. So, uh, let's see, that special, and was like, I can't remember, it's like 84 or 85, I think, maybe, but it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was Bob Saget, Louis Anderson, Rita Rudner, Sam Kinison. Um, who else was on that special? A guy named Bob Nelson that I fucking loved. Uh, Bob Nelson was really awesome. Uh, uh, Yakov Smirnoff was on there. <laughs> because in Russia, comedy specials watch you. All right, um... <laughs> Hacky joke. <laughs> and so and so that just that really just changed, you know, like that that shaped me as a as a comedy consumer and all and made me want to do comedy, uh, you know. So I I thought, well, we have this podcast and a lot of people listen to it, so we should do a comedian and we can't call it I don't want to call it young comedian specials because these guys are, are seasoned professionals. So we decided let's call it the comedians you should know special. So that's what we have for you tonight. Uh, the comedians you should know special. So uh, before we start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shovel some of my bullshit on you to try to <laughs> warm you up a bit. Uh, I, I, I'm, in, I'm well into my 30s, and I am feeling my age for the first time in my life, and it's weird. And I'm noticing little things like, like oversharing. I am become an oversharer. <laughs> Have you ever been trapped with an elderly person, and they just talk on and on about anything? Cat, cereal, it doesn't matter. Just, they just need to say things. And I, I have started to do this. This is, a, this is something that happens with aging. Uh, I was, I was at, a, at an Asian restaurant earlier, and I was ordering some noodles, and I said to the server, uh, yes, I will have the vegetarian noodles. I mean, I'm not a vegetarian. I'm just, it's just I know that as you get older, you should probably eat a lot less meat, and I want to try to live healthier. And it's like, because I've been working out a lot lately, and I really <laughs> feel like it's important to feed your body. Like, you want to hug your body, you know? And, like, I used to drink a lot, and if you don't kill me, I'm not going to stop these words from coming out! Like, <laughs> it was really, it's, it's really awful. You, uh, how many, any, anyone 35 out there? Any 35s out there? Any 30s out there? Yeah, 30s. Any, are you freaked out about 30? 
You are? I See, 30's not weird. 35 is fucking weird. <laughs> That's the awful one, because 35 is the year you start checking a whole different box when you're filling out surveys. <laughs> and it fucking hurts! You take it for granted. For 16 years, you live in this sweet big country called 18 to 34. <laughs> and then after that, it's just 35 to corpse. Like, no one gives a fuck anymore. They don't give a shit about you. Because you're old and creepy and weird. Your priorities change. Like, for instance, this is for my 35s and up. 35s and below, I take a powder. Uh, <laughs> 35s and up, let me ask you this question. What happened to fingering? What happened to fingering? <laughs> you remember when that was a part of your daily vernacular when you're young? Fingering, yeah, fingering. You never even say the word past 35. It never, ever comes up because no one ever says like, I want to go home and finger the wife. Like those two words are not ever in close proximity to each other, ever. But when you're young, you know, it's, it's awesome. Like it's fingering is just part of this really complex teenage negotiation where a young boy will say like, I would like to put this in there. And she's like, no, but how about these? And you're like, I accept your terms. <laughs> even, even, even the word, even the word fingering just sounds weird. Like to make, to make a verb out of finger. I fingered, I fingered. That sounds like a word an alien would use if he were trying to fit in with humans <laughs> so he could take them over. Greetings, dudes. I just fingered a human female in the back of my car. <laughs> then I penised her for seven Earth minutes. <laughs> I love intercoursing. Take me to your leader. <laughs> And, and hot tubbing is something else I did in college. Uh, love, love, hot tubbing just sounds so awesome when you're in college. Like, hot tubbing, we go hot tubbing, get all naked with some chicks and go hot tubbing. I have a hot tub at my house. I'm, I've never been in it, ever, ever. Because <laughs> when you're young, you just think that sounds so awesome. You're like, yeah, we get some naked chicks in the hot tub. And then at a certain point, you just realize that four naked people in hot water, you're just brewing ass tea. That's what you're accomplishing. <laughs> Dude, but there's like naked chicks in there and they're leaking fluids into our shared space. It is downright unsanitary. That's a word you never use before 35, unsanitary. But after 35, it shapes the parameters of the landscape of your life. I stay in a lot of hotels because I'm a touring comedian and hotels are fucking unsanitary. A hotel is a place where people rent the right to put their balls on everything. Doesn't matter. Just setting it on stuff, using them for the remote is like a, it's like a, it's like a changing wand or something. And they, like even, because uh, they can, because they can. Like I, I'm back in the room, better turn the lights on. They'll just use their balls because it's funny. Because you can't, you can't do that at home. Your significant other would, would never be cool. They'd be like, why are there ball prints on the lamp? This is not a hotel. Fuck. <laughs> They're disgusting places, disgusting places. And always, I, I would say six times out of 10, people, I'm, I'm in a room next to a couple that is how, they're having the loudest sex of their relationship. Because again, they're at a hotel and they don't care. And usually that's awesome because, uh, I don't know if you're like me, but when I hear the couple next door starting to get into it, after about 10 or 15 minutes, we're all in a three-way they're not aware they're in. And that is, that is fine, but recently I was in a situation where the dude was louder than the lady. No es bueno. First of all, I, I mean, I don't, he, the whole time he was like, I think he was trying, I think they were trying to get pregnant because he just kept going, oh, baby, baby. Like he was trying to call the shot. Baby. Pointing at her uterus, baby. <laughs> and she clearly was not into it because she didn't say anything for most of it. And then finally, after a while, she just eked out a like a defeated sounding. Oh, you fuck so well. 
I am not claiming to be super awesome at sex, but I am fairly certain you are not supposed to use proper grammar while in the throes of passion. You're not supposed to have the presence of mind to use an adverb properly. You're supposed to descend into your lizard brain because you're caught up in the moment, the passion, all these words fly out of your mouth. You know what the fuck you're saying? It's just like, you good fucking sauce. Like, you don't know what you're saying. You are not supposed to sound more educated than when you started. I would like to express my sincere gratitude for the sound fucking you're delivering me. Oh, truly I've received a full ride scholarship to Orgasm College. <laughs> I, was, I was performing at the San Francisco Punchline, the same thing happened. In the, in the next room I hear the like, Ah, uh, I hear the bed creaking. I start to hear the noises, and I'm like, all right. So I began to take my position. <laughs> and I heard one voice go, yeah, suck it. And I heard another voice go, I'm fucking gonna. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was left with a choice. <laughs> but I am not a quitter. I am not a quitter. <laughs> I almost, like, as nerdy as I grew up, you know, like, the whole, you know, like, everything that I was into, like, D&D, &D, chess club, Latin club, computer camp, like, everything made vaginas go away, and, but I did almost lose my virginity when I was 15, which was a very big deal, very big deal, and in retrospect, it wasn't because there was anything special about me, it's just I was dating a girl uh, who had very religious parents, and so what happens sometimes is when two really religious people procreate, for some reason, their belief system is able to spawn a virulent strain of super slut. Yeah. And so that was the case. Uh, and so this girl was willing to have sex with me, and I really liked that about her. And so we were about to... <laughs> so... <laughs> We're, we're about to do the deed. We're getting into the position. And, uh, and, the, and I don't know how to say this other than the engine flooded before I could get the car in the garage. I prematurely ejaculated, if you know what I mean. And listen, normally that's not a problem if you're a 15 year a teenage boy. Like, I would have been ready to go again immediately. Like, boners are like Kleenex for a teenage boy. There's, oh, there's another one, like, right there. <laughs> but it turns out that the female of the species is not biologically programmed to respond in a sexual manner when the male of the species ejaculates near her and then cries on her face. Those two things... <laughs> <laughs> that's alright I just went back to my fucking room and started drawing ligers and tigons <laughs> I did love it's like the first time I saw Napoleon Dynamite he was like my favorite animal is a liger I was like mine fucking too like I got so I love hybrid animals it's so fascinating I mean like there are hybrid species there are hybrid species they're, they're, they're hybrids they, it's, it's sort of a it's, it's like a species cul-de-sac, though. They're always seem like they can't produce offspring, but it's fun. They don't, like, lions don't choose to mate with tigers in the wild. Humans make them do it. <laughs> because we can. But humans are like these big dumb kids in a sandbox just point at things. They're like, mm, you, fuck that. I want to see what happens. <laughs> and like, so we get, we get ligers and tiglons and, 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 and zorses and growler bears. <laughs> And yet humans cannot produce offspring with our closest cousin species, the chimpanzee. We cannot get a chimpanzee pregnant. So you know what that means? No condoms. <laughs> Fuck yeah, you guys. Oh, here I come, chimps. Oh, oh, oh. Look out, cheetah. <laughs> did, you, did you say look out, cheetah? <laughs> well, I might as well throw my fantasy animal into the mix. That's what we're talking about, right? I mean, we're all on the same page. Let's <laughs> just see a guy. <laughs> this is a prelude to a mauling. A guy with his arm around a cheetah who just starts trying to force its head down onto his cock and then... 
cheetahs do not like to have their heads forced down on cocks. They won't stand for it. <laughs> Fastest animal on earth don't like to be objectified either. That's another... <laughs> uh... I'll wrap it up with this. I, uh, I, as much of a sci-fi fanatic as I am, uh, and I appreciate your frack me shirt, sir. Uh, the, the cheetah lover up front. Is this your wife? No. Girlfriend? Girlfriend. Some, it, 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 it kind of makes sense now where he's like, look, I'm just saying just draw a couple spots on your body and, <laughs> and then just run really fast around the yard. sense now <laughs> do you ever go to that strip club cheetahs and you walk out mad like this is a fucking false advertising what a rip there's not one fucking cheetah in this place they're all humans <laughs> just want to stuff a dollar bill in the cheetahs g-string <laughs> I do love sci-fi. I, I, I am still, uh, I am still completely confused by the proliferation of ghost hunting shows that have taken over every cable channel where they're suggesting life after death, except for the news channels. <laughs> Don't you think if there were life after death, maybe it would make the news? Maybe USA Today, HuffPo, CNN. We'd be, we'd be, we'd be freaking out. Like, there, you'd turn out, you'd be like, this is Wolf Blitzer tonight in the Situation Room. Now there's fucking ghosts! Run! Like, someone would... It wouldn't be on the Travel Channel. It wouldn't be... It wouldn't, after, life After Death wouldn't be discovered by four dudes who look like sports bar bouncers bumbling their way through an abandoned hospital with a shaky night vision camera. Like, bro, my neck just got cold, bro. Did you blow me? Bro, my arm just got stiff. Bro, bro, fuck, bro. Bro, fuck. Bro, fuck, bro. <laughs> Every ghost they're hunting on those shows is like a hundred years old plus. Have you ever noticed there are no new ghosts? <laughs> is the ghosthood process that red tapey that it takes about a century for the paperwork to go through or whatever? Like there's no, every one of those shows they're like, well, let me tell you about our ghost. You see in 1884, a little girl died outside in a well. And now at 3 a.m. you can hear little wet footprints in the hallway. Like no one ever says, in 1984, a young man died on the Sunset Strip. And now at 3 a.m., you can hear the rattling of a chain wallet on acid wash jeans. <laughs> As a side note, do you think Patrick Swayze now goes up behind people in pottery classes and hugs them just to crack up other goats? All right, I believe you are suitably warmed up. We should start this show. Comedians, you should know on the Nerdist Podcast. Uh, and, I, and I have to say, like, these are all people that I know, I've known for years, uh, and I adore them. And your first comic is a, not only an incredible artist, uh, but he also has an album out called Fairbanks, with an apostrophe. Uh, it's one of the top ten albums on Amazon right now, comedy albums. And I asked him about that, and he was like, I don't think that's because I sold a lot. I think some nerds decided that. So <laughs> even putting himself down, despite the fact that he is a masterful comedian, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Chris Fairbanks! <laughs> that's funny, Chris. And I, uh, I know that you're not a self-professed nerd. I think people have proven it. Other people, civilians. Uh, but he said cheetah because that's Tarzan's orangutan friend. <laughs> so touche. He didn't want to fuck a cat. <laughs> he just knew some shit about impregnating primates. And that was a animated episode you may have missed. Now I'm a nerd because I think uh, Tarzan was some episodic cartoon. <laughs> oh, you missed the third season of Tarzan where he fucked that ape and had an ape baby? <laughs> yeah, yeah bigger. What's that? Oh, I made that up in my dreams and head? Uh, yeah, crazy sauce. Chris was talking about uh, people saying like uh, primal things. Ooh, Segway City. Uh, 
while having sex. I like to combine the two. Like I, uh, I do get all fancy with it. Uh, but then all of a sudden it gets primal at the last minute. So like uh, I'll be having sex and I'm like, uh, pardon me, ma'am, but I have something to say. <laughs> Daddy's about to go number three. <laughs> I like to combine the two. It's very descriptive. I almost feel like you should just be up here. <laughs> just on my lap. Well, it's not distracting at all. Well, don't say things that I wouldn't say. <laughs> Do a lot of visual uh, jokes uh, during a pod. I, uh, okay, girls. Can we, um, I, who here says occasionally, go ahead and admit it if uh, you go... Uh, that's what she said after like there's certain moments where you feel okay stop fucking clapping your hands and phalanges cause that's don't stop please stop don't not stop do stop stop saying that's what she said and then so I just said please stop and he said that's what she said like it, it's an infectious everyone wants to do it here's the thing that's from Wayne's World remember that movie yeah that's an old one if I start saying not after what you said I just get punched and hit with hockey sticks my mom dressed up like Garth one Halloween. I think it was 1991. And she like had, she had drumsticks. She did a great job. She even got a shirt that he wears. And the whole night she said, that's what she said. That was 1991. And once again, that was my mom. So please fucking stop. Stop doing that. And don't misuse the word ghetto. There's a lot of girls that are, ah, oh, these shoes are so ghetto. Yeah, yeah, totally compare your tattered straps on your pumps to a housing project. That doesn't offend anyone. <laughs> these shoes are so ghetto. <laughs> I'm, uh, I think I'm shooting blanks, actually. Chris touched on that. When I ejaculate, nothing comes out at all. Just a, a loud bang and a puff of smoke. <laughs> and then a flag unfurls. And it says, sorry. <laughs> On it. I just found out I'm uh, part Native American, which is interesting. Wish I'd known that before college. It's not by blood, it's just I was born because my mom used a dream catcher as a diaphragm. And it's, uh, you know, you learn about Montana history in weird ways. Yeah, go ahead and let it drip. What's with all these owls graduating from something? Every time... I meet and or see an owl. He's wearing a graduation hat. We can all agree on that. First of all, owl, I know you're a wise bird. Poor bird. Uh, uh, but I haven't seen you on campus all year yet. Here you are suddenly at the commencement ceremony, tassel to the left. It's funny, owl. Um, what's your major? If you don't mind me asking. Actually, I first got interested in anatomy when I puked up my first mouse skeleton. But my passion is in statistics when I started monitoring my Tootsie Pop licks. <laughs> All right, touche, owl. Hey, maybe you want to meet us in the quad for some ultimate frisbee. <laughs> I couldn't say the word ultimate. <laughs> maybe he is wise. If, we, if we've learned anything um, from their skunks, I think we can just assume that French people are violent rapists. <laughs> um, in weird ways. Disguise yourself, paint a stripe on her to get ready. It's always weird. And that's what turned into patriot, patriotic hatred towards French people. We've met French people. They're all nice. Gerard Depardieu, he's a great guy. Yet we're supposed to hate him because of Pepe, Pepe Le Pew. Pepe Pepe Le Pew. I hate him so much I said the first part twice. I'm not stuttering. I'm just cold. 
I love picking out laughs and knowing who that person is in a room of possibly 200. Hello, Jazz. Why am I nervous? I feel nervous. It's weird. It's a normal thing. Everyone's supposed to be afraid of public speaking and heights, I think. It's weird because we're all just ignoring what everyone is way, way more afraid of, which is getting tipped over while in an outhouse. Like, how could we... That's the scariest thing ever. I can never shit comfortably at a fair. At least you can build up an immunity and then once, uh, yeah, I'm ready to give a speech. I've been practicing. You can't practice for the outhouse. That'd be a weird series. Yeah, I'm gonna walk this gauntlet. You guys, just throw this shit at me. All these buckets. Don't ask how I filled them. Just keep throwing. The OC Fair's coming up. I want to see the guy from Creed. I, uh... <laughs> There's a company. I think they do okay because there's several locations, but they're shittily named and uh, just tires. Uh, really limiting. They have more. Here's a better name, Just Tires. How about Tires, colon, and more? You don't even need Tires, comma, and more. Maybe I've just figured out why your oil changes aren't flying off the shelves. <laughs> just Tires? <laughs> yeah, uh, I can't believe I already did my closer. <laughs> Fucking... I, already, I wrote that joke down and then uh, parentheses followed by you being carried off on everyone's shoulders. <laughs> Get ready for the confetti and a check from Just Tires, comma, and more. Oh, you combine them because of my request. <laughs> uh, I, like, uh, I like comedy. What? The... Sure. Yeah, I like comedy. Well, let me profess it while I do it. I like what I'm doing. I, I don't understand early comedy, like, uh, like Three Stooges. Do you ever watch Three Stooges episodes? They're episodic, much like Tarzan was. <laughs> it's weird. Every episode of uh, the Three Stooges, apparently they were like independent contractors, laborers. Uh, and they worked shittily together. They worked horribly. It, uh, they never finished a job because they'd start fighting. But every episode, they're doing a different thing. Totally unrelated to the last, but obviously there's like references that got them the next gig. Yeah, you did a great job moving my piano. Why don't you pull my Civil War general friend's tooth? And then maybe you guys to get together. I don't know, do you bake fancy cakes? I have a friend who needs some construction work done. Do you guys pull elephants upstairs accidentally? <laughs> uh, they sucked at everything, because they're just like, hey, you, you bumped into me. Boom, right in the eye. Fingers in the eyes? You're the worst friend ever. And or, oh, that's the shittiest move ever, finger in the eye. And then the guy comes and he's like, oh, I hope the wing on my house and my little music box is fixed. And they just show up and there's a two by four through a window. Is that blood on my floor? <laughs> Yeah, well, if it's any consolation, they were kind of funny to some of the men in the room. <laughs> well, that does it. That's the last time I hire Three Stooges Plumbing to bake me a fancy cake. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, you guys. I've been Chris Fairbanks. Fantastic. All right. Keeping the show moving. Identifying what I'm doing instead of just doing it. Uh, <laughs> your next performer, uh, I believe I first started, I think I first met her in like 99 maybe. We used to do the show in Westwood uh, at this place called the Gypsy Cafe. Uh, that It was super, super fun show uh, that only one other person went to. Uh, <laughs> And it got, it ultimately it got taken over uh, by wealthy uh, Persian teenagers who wanted to smoke hookah pipes. Uh, and who apparently don't really want to hear white people point out the foibles of mankind. 
so we <laughs> stopped doing the show there. Uh, but I've known her forever, and I love her. She, she does a podcast called Dork Forest. Uh, have you ever heard of Dork Forest? And also uh, has uh, an album out called It's Never Gonna Be Bread. Ladies and gentlemen, Jackie Cation! <laughs> Yes. The Persians took over, and then he introduces an Armenian lady. Uh, I am Armenian. I know I don't look it. And uh, which was said to me actually about a month ago at the Whole Foods. I handed my credit card to the lady, and she goes, You look Armenian in that voice that said, You seem nice. And, and I have this to say. We gotta give everybody a generation, right? I mean, your, your grandparents were assholes, right? I mean, everybody's an asshole when they come here because it's frustrating, because nobody comes here because things are going well. Right now, in Guatemala, no one is sitting around going, I know I'm a dentist here, but what I really wanna do is wash clothing for a living. So I'm gonna move to Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, and I know the new Armenians all smell vaguely of fake Giorgio and the Cold War, but let's... Fucking melt. Anyway, so, um, and if it's any consolation, they're mean to me too. Okay, so, because I have melted. And, uh, I am, uh, I never dress up anymore. Used to dress up for the stand up comedy here in the Los Angeles area and then realized never gonna fucking matter. Uh, because, uh, casting people will still look at me and go, airport cop. And, <laughs> waste of my time. So here's the good news. When professionals in, are involved, this cleans right up. Cleans up nice. So uh, until then, this is, uh, this is what I look like. So, uh, and it's fine. But um, other than that, I worked my old day job. I quit my old day job a while ago, but I helped out at Christmas and, uh, and worked my old day job. And then about four hours into it, I was like, that's right, that's why I quit this fucking job. These people are idiots. And I hate it and my shoulder hurts. Okay, so... Um, uh, in other news, uh, Chris was talking about fingering. I use it. I'm over 35. Let's talk about it. Uh, I, uh, I was arguing with, uh, with, uh, with a Christian uh, or someone who claimed to be. And uh, again, raised in the Armenian church. Great thing about being raised in the Armenian church, all in Armenian. I don't speak Armenian, so uh, I get to believe whatever I want, which is be like the nice man in the picture and go get your dad some coffee. So that was the extent of it. So, um, so uh, someone was talking about how uh, they wanted, and it was George Bush had said it uh, as well, which was he wanted to be alive to see the rapture. George Bush actually said he wanted to be alive. To see, guess what? If you're alive to see the rapture, you fucking drop the ball, dumb shit. <laughs> You're supposed to be gone. And, uh, and second of all, I don't wanna. I don't wanna see the rapture. Uh, I don't want, you know what I wanna, uh, I wanna die very old in my bed being fingered to death by someone I love. <laughs> Yay! It's a much, yes, it's a beautiful image. It's better than the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, so, we're in a comic book store, so I'm gonna talk about pop things. Uh, which is, well, I just, I went and saw Red and Expendables at the Pasadena Arclight. Uh, okay, first of all, these are old people in action movies, right? Right, we all know. And, uh, and they're old people watching the action movies because it's an Arclight. And, uh, and what you could do is you could get a nice glass of wine and have your assigned seat and sit down and watch 60-year-old people deal with their problems by punching people. <laughs> and it was my first clue that this generation will not be going gently into the good night. <laughs> They will not diminish like Galadriel and go into the West. And uh, I want them to. I want them to. Uh, ooh, I, Lord of the Rings. I am going to start uh, a business called One Wing to Rule Them All. And uh, it is going to be a chicken restaurant. And... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love chicken. And if you know the uh, elvish word for, uh, for, for, uh, for... Uh, elvish word for friend, free soda. Anyone? At least three people come up to me and tell me. Okay, and then we'll get some. We'll get some nice. Anyway, uh, I am married uh, to a giant dork who makes video games for a living, and, uh, and it's very exciting. I know. I said, "How did you get that job?" And he said, "Well, it's perfectly obvious how I got that job. I fought my way through several levels." <laughs> yes, yes, it's a great joke. And then he killed the boss. And. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, he's great. And he's a game designer, right? So he'll play any game. Any game you want to play. Paper, scissors, rock, card games, board games, video games, dress up like an elf. Uh, go away for the weekend. Dude's on board. More than once when we were organizing our wedding, he referred to our outfits as costumes. <laughs> he wanted us to dress as pirates and take over another wedding. Uh, I am not saying that that would not have been fun. I am saying that I'm not organizing two weddings, crazy man. And he's like, well, why would we have to organize a second one? Arr. And, and he wanted to wear a crown to our, to our wedding. And uh, one of my friends was like, and you're going to let him? And that's when I knew I hadn't done any dating before because I didn't know that I could not let him do things. But it, it didn't matter because he could wear his underpants and carry a pork chop because he's awesome. Anyway, but get this. Ooh, that's the other thing. I'm going to tell three jokes at once. Okay, so uh, I just saw like a, two months ago, they have ma adult male underoos at Target. Uh, adult men's, not boxers, briefs uh, with Iron Man, Superman, Spider-Man. Uh, yeah, out of, I thought it was hilarious. And I bought him a pair and he put them on and I was like, take them off, take them off. <laughs> there is nothing less sexual than an Iron Man underpant on a grown ass man. Cause uh, either that or I'll run you a bath and make you some bagel bites. Uh, Cause that's out of, it's completely out of hand. I never dated because I do stand-up comedy, right? I've been doing stand-up comedy since women comics would get stage time right before they were burned as a witch. <laughs> Hester Prynne opened for me. Mm -hmm. That's the best chance that joke's ever had. Uh, <laughs> let's try this one. I think Sarah Palin would make an excellent president if we lived in The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> Yes, women's studies in the middle. Okay, so, but get this. So, uh, so I never dated. I've been doing stand-up comedy forever, and I never dated. And when we were dating, my husband at one point, like it was pulled out of him. He said, it's so great that you've never really dated anybody because you have no expectations of me. And I was like, I have expectations. Of, and he said, what are your expectations of me? And I said, I expect you to be nice. I expect you to be polite. I expect that if we ever live together, that you will keep the common areas clean and that you will do your share of the chores. And he goes, yeah, those are roommate expectations. <laughs> and I said, well, what are boyfriend expectations? And he said, you don't need to know. <laughs> I kid you not. And I said, did you just do the, hmm. Anyway. Fantastic. Okay. I, uh, I might end early. Never know. Oh, no! This is happening the other... Wait! Found something. Which is hilarious. Okay, so we're in the car uh, last week, and I just said, out of the blue, I said, I'll do whatever you want. And he took it to mean sexually. And, and he was like, yes. And I was like, what? What just happened? And, uh, and he goes, would you wear an outfit? And I was like, of? And he said, would you wear a shark outfit? <laughs> dress as a shark and I was like what would happen that's unnatural because at what point are you wearing a shark outfit as a lady and somebody says do you back that up that doesn't work <laughs> long way to go for sharks can't go backwards okay um, and I will leave you on this <laughs> which is uh we uh, went on our honeymoon, and he wanted us to get matching tattoos. And I do not have a tattoo. I don't want a tattoo. I am not tattoo people. Uh, and I said, instead of a tattoo, why don't we do what old people in Wisconsin do, where I'm from, when they travel, which is collect those spoons. And, and he said, oh my god, let's get tattoos of those spoons. We'll both get like a cabinet tattooed on our backs, and then everywhere that we go, we'll get a different spoon tattooed for the rest of our lives. And I was like, wow, I would rather get a plate in my head and collect magnets. <laughs> Rhode Island. Thanks a lot, you guys. Enjoy the rest of the show. Jackie Cation. <laughs> there is a recurring theme tonight with the animals. Uh, by the way, d I saw you in the back, and when she talked about her, her husband wanting to dress up like a shark, I thought I saw you go like, nod, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Because if, pe if people could fuck animals, though, I think you're on the right, I think it would be cats first. Clearly the internet has shown us that we would fuck cats first. 
No, I can has cheeseburger now, Mr. Boots. <laughs> Isn't it? Why else did why else would they make Antonio Banderas the voice of the nasal next be? They weren't trying to tap into our innate desires to fuck animals. Insect. It's like that commercial. Like, is that too sexy for nasal spray, Antonio Banderas? Too sexy for nasal spray? You're just on your couch and this this Latino bee comes. Oh, nasal necks. Oh, I'm going to fuck your nose open. Oh, nasal necks. Oh, your nasal passage is dry. I'm going to make it wet. Oh, nasal necks. Oh, fuck, nasal necks. Ah, oh, Dios mío, nasal necks. <laughs> How's that asthma treating you? Great, a Latino bee ejaculated in my nose. It, somehow it worked. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, the next person that I would like to bring uh, to the stage is regularly on this very podcast. Not only that, he regularly co-produces this very show. His two worlds are colliding. If you were to look at the Venn diagram of his work, it would be a perfect single circle because it all overlaps. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Jonah Ray! <laughs> Chris Hardwick, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And of course, the empty seat right up front where my dad should be sitting. <laughs> Once again, I'm always waiting for him to show up so I can kick him in the face. Thank you so much for coming to this. I really appreciate it. Um, some of you might know my, uh, my voice from uh, chiming in inappropriately when Chris is talking to someone famous. Uh, or it's like, I too do stand... Okay, I'll stand back. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I saw that show and you were... I, okay, I'm, I'm back, back here. I'll somehow try to talk as much as Matt Myra, which is not much at all. <laughs> Um, everybody, I, I realized this recently uh, that I need to stop drinking as much beer because I'm really fat. Uh, not really fat, but just like a fat enough to where I just like, you know, I sit on a plane and then it just all piles up in front of me. You can't tell that by me standing, but once I sit down in a tiny seat, it just grows and I can't put down the tray. I need to stop drinking as much. I, I switched to vodka, which I'm heard is the last booze. They, can, can they consider it the last booze because they're like, I'm like, ex I'm excited about it. I'm like, oh, there's really no hangover. And they're like, yeah, I know, that's why. It's the last one you drink when you realize you hit bottom. <laughs> because you drink it and then all of a sudden it's like, it's like I did something really bad. No, fucking really bad. <laughs> Nothing really bad has happened to me drinking yet, so why not keep going until it does? <laughs> I, um, I, I, but the thing is, like, I, I try to drink vodka because I don't want to drink beer. Beer is fattening because my favorite kind of beer is like a Hefeweizen, a wheat beer, you know, a very hearty beer. I love it. It's so good. I, I love, I love them so much. But the thing is, it's like, that's like the most fattening beer you can drink. That's like saying, hey, man, what's your favorite kind of bread? Cake. <laughs> Cake's my favorite kind of bread. Oh, yeah. Ham Swiss on red velvet. Mwah! I'll eat it up. I've resigned to the fact that I'm just going to be the doughy guy. I'm going to be the guy, if I'm ever at a pool party, uh, let me restate that, if I'm ever invited to a pool party, <laughs> I'm the guy that just has his shirt on in the pool. You know, that guy. The guy everyone's like, what's he hiding? <laughs> and then the guy's next to him just like, man boobs, what else? What, what else? What, why does anyone else wear it? And then like, it's like, the thing is, if you're not the guy with the shirt on in the pool, you're the other guy that should have his shirt on in the pool. <laughs> Where just uh, everyone's like, oh, good for him. Good for him. Just let it all hang out. Doesn't care about what we think. As much as he should, he should care. He should. Just, he doesn't, he just let it all hang out. It's like, the thing is, it's like, it's like I'm resigned to the fact I'm just going to be like, you know, the guy with the shirt on. Like, you know, but I'm not going to pick up a girl that way. There's never been a girl in this world that said, hey, who's that guy with the soaking wet shirt sitting on the steps of the pool? <laughs> With the shorts that don't belong in water. Cut off jeans? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I bet that guy knows a lot about zombies. <laughs> he does, because it's me, and I do. 
I realized recently that the name TJ Maxx should mean a really cool thing, and it doesn't. <laughs> TJ Maxx is a horrible clothing store. TJ Maxx shouldn't be that. TJ Maxx should be the coolest kid in school. <laughs> should be like, did you hear about TJ Maxx? He beat up everybody. Didn't fucking leave out girls, boys, principals, teachers. He fucked them all. <laughs> he left everyone out. Except for Ross. He, he gets along with Ross pretty well. <laughs> TJ Maxx is the coolest. I, um, I, I like, uh, I, I have a girlfriend now, and she's awesome. She's a delight. I, 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 she's a lot of my life, uh, and she's a lot better than that horrible cunt ex-girlfriend I used to have, <laughs> which I find is usually the case, no matter what. Uh, I, got, I was at a point recently in a breakup where it's like, you know, I was so sad that, like, you know, I would have to go up to a girl and say, uh, hey, do you like the simultaneous feeling of cum and tears on your back? <laughs> Because I could provide that for you. It would be during awkward sex that neither of us will like. But for you, it could be a fun guessing game. Guess the consistency. Everyone's going, oh, because they know the one would be slower than the other. <laughs> Rolling down the side. I, um... No, I, 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 like, I like the girlfriend I have now because uh, uh, the thing is the last girlfriend I had, we, uh, we lived together. And when, when, you, when I was moving in with her, I was convinced that when you move in with a girlfriend, you have sex all of the time everywhere. And then in actuality, you were right with that noise that because cause it's fucking none of the time anywhere. It just fucking becomes a theory in some guy's head that sex exists. It's like, it's this fucking, I don't know what happened. I think it's sealed up. And then she's, she's like, oh, there's no way we can do it. I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even want to know what happens when you get married. Does it just turn into a dick? You know, I was like, I guess I'm fucking got to suck it now. <laughs> but just, it went away. It sucked. It went away. And I just, I remember like telling my friends, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm going to live with a girlfriend. I can wake up in the middle of the night and she's going to be right there and I can fuck her. I can fuck her. That's the way, that's the rules. That's the rules. And like, it's like, it's not, I heard that, okay, it's still rape. Uh, <laughs> which is very, it was very upsetting to hear. Very upsetting. And, uh, the thing is, though, it's like, it's like I, and I didn't have time to masturbate. And, and I needed to. I need, there was like pressure building up in me. It was like sperm, like building up from my balls and into my hands, and I wanted to fucking kill her. <laughs> it's like, it, like, it's like, it was like when spin, like, you know, Papa eats spinach, and she was like, what? Ah! <laughs> It's fucking like, I didn't want to murder anybody, but I was like, if I can't create life, I will destroy one. <laughs> and I fucking need, I need to relieve the pressure. It was like a factory that was about to blow up. And one guy's like, oh, stay behind. Oh, don't worry about me. And so like, there was this one time, because it was hard. I couldn't find a time to masturbate because it was like, I would leave for work before her. I would come home from work after her. There was no time to do it. Until this one day that I made a point. I was like, I made, I was like I'm going to treat myself good today. I'm going to fucking jerk off. <laughs> Yeah, this is a me day. So I tell my I tell my bosses at work that I got a doctor's appointment. Technically, not the not a lie. Technically, not a lie. Because if I wasn't gonna do that, either I would get hurt or someone else would. And so I fucking I just like I left work and I was like uh, I was driving home so fast. I was like weaving through traffic. I was just I'm surprised I didn't get pulled over. But even if I did, I'm sure the cop I would have been like I got a girlfriend I live with and she does never seal it. It's a fucking I don't. And he's like he would probably be just like go hurry up, get out of here you. Well here I'll guide you through with my sirens. <laughs> and so I fucking get home. And I, uh, I, I just, ru we had three dogs and I just like rushed past them, which is very confusing to a dog when someone gets home. When, it, when you get home, a dog's like, fuck yeah, this is what I've been waiting for. I'm going to get pet behind this ear, that ear, maybe my fucking belly if I show it off. The dogs are excited and they're like, oh shit, he's home early. And then I just like whisk by them and they're like, oh, what the fuck? I eat that shitty food for pets and now this? And so, like, I just, I run into the bedroom and I just start fucking going for it. Not even in a pleasurable way. There was no pleasure in this because this was just fucking, I needed this to happen. I needed the relief of pressure. And I was, and it hurt. It hurt. I was hurting myself. And I was just, like, going for it so hard. And like, like, just trying to get it done so before she got home. And, and the thing is, it was like, when I was doing that, I was, like, making such a ruckus that, like, I fucking, you know, when dogs hear a commotion, they're like, oh, shit, it's playtime in there. 
What a fucking great joke Jonah just did. He walked by us and now was fucking, let's all go inside. And so they all run in at, at the wrong time, at the end time. And then I had to do something that I never thought I would have to do in my entire life, which was kick dogs while coming. <laughs> And it was fucking, and like, I, like, and the thing is that it wasn't like, it wasn't weird. I was like, you know, I was just trying to like, you know, get him away from me. It was like, it was, I, I wasn't like weirded out by the situation. I wasn't like surprised by it. I was scared. I was so scared because what if that was the best orgasm I ever had? And then from now on, I'm just like, uh, listen, uh, girl I'm dating, do you have a dog? Well, you better get one. <laughs> Because the only way I'm going to come in you is if I can kick a fucking canine. Uh, you guys ever do that thing where you're in a public bathroom and then like, you hear uh, someone like, taking a horrible shit and then you look at their shoes like it might have some kind of answer to what's going on? You just like you're hanging out, washing your hands, and you just hear and then you're like, oh shit, <laughs> clown shoes. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Eats a lot of fair food. <laughs> Probably wears a shirt in the pool. <laughs> I uh, I love I and here's the thing. I'm not like it's like I I'm on a I'm on a very nerdy podcast, and I uh and like you know we we like to think that we're like very progressively minded, but I love like me and my I talk with my friends about shitting and how much I love it. And it's like, it's silly, it's dumb, it's very like rudimentary, but like, it's just like, I fucking love it. You can't, you can't deny that it's number two because sex is like the best thing ever and then right after that is fucking shitting. <laughs> shitting is the best thing ever. And like, I would, I would probably be gay if like the anal sex part was only the second part where if it was just a dick coming out of my ass. <laughs> if there was a way to just have dicks come out of my ass but not in, in it would hurt, but out, I would fucking want that. If there was some way where I can get dicks in my body and then just to come, if I could just shit out dicks. If I could just shit out dicks over and over again until I come, it would be the fucking, I would be gay, I would be gay right away. But I don't know if I could take a pill and they just stayed inside my belly and then I just start shitting out little dicks and then if I let it sit for a while, huge dicks come out and they're all black and huge and it feels fucking great. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to get them into my body though. You know, I'm not sure. So I could I could eat it, but that would be gay, and then I'm not though. So I'm not sure how I'm gonna do it. Everybody, I've been Jonah Ray. Thank you so much for listening to the things I have to say. Please, everybody, my good friend Chris Hardwick. Everybody's Jonah Ray, okay. Jonah Ray. Also, uh, also writes for WebSoup. Jonah Ray also writes for the WebSoup show. And, and uh, you can follow him on his new Twitter account. <laughs> Jonah had a Twitter account. And uh, he got, got possessed by a hipster and was like, fuck it, man. I'm, I'm canceled Twitter. I don't fucking need Twitter. And Because and, and, he got drunk and he thought it would be funny and cool. Uh, and then within a month, he was like, fuck, I gotta get back on Twitter. So he got rid of at Jonah Ray. You can follow him at at a ray of Jonah uh, <laughs> on Twitter. And also, please, I want to have, have, have a hand for Matt Myra, who's in the back there running the board. Matt, are you back there? Do you have your microphone? I, uh, yes. How are you, Matthew Myra? I am well, Chris. How is everything sounding back there? Please tell me that... It is working fantastically. <laughs> Steve Jobs' little baby hasn't crashed on us back there. Nope. I hope you're referring to me. <laughs> Still going on a five-hour energy. No. <laughs> <laughs> you feeling okay back there? No, it's good. It's nice. I get to sit and enjoy while you people do all the hard work. Oh, that sounded half sarcastic. I don't really know. No, no, it was genuine. Oh, okay. I, like, I like sitting a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've seen me, but I don't tend to move. I've never seen you. I just, it's a I'm weird a thing. I'm a phantom in your head, Chris. What? I don't exist. I'm a new ghost. <laughs> I love that you just called back my joke. That's awesome. You're welcome, buddy. That is an excellent callback, Matthew Myra. The comedy team of Hard and Meyer. Mm, not the same ring. I guess it's not. Same as Hard and Firm. Um, 
All right, uh, I would like to bring up your next performing comedian who is also a co-producer of this show and uh, someone who I've not known as long. I think we've probably been probably friends for two or three years, but the first time I saw this guy was immediately, because I'm, I'm such a comedy nerd and a comedy whore that I'm like, I have to be friends with that guy, that man, he's very funny. Uh, I didn't approach him like that because that would have been aggressive and weird. Uh, but I am glad that we became friends and he is here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kumail Nanjiani! <laughs> everyone <laughs> fucking awesome so fucking cool be here you guys are wonderful uh th oh that was a sincere moment yeah it was another sincere moment okay i fucking love christmas i really do what do you guys think of christmas see i but I, I feel like a lot of people are jaded about it but i've been in the country 10 years you know so this is my 10th christmas so remember how excited you were for fucking Christmas when you were 10 years old? That's me right now. I'm like 10 years old, like Christmas is back. We did not skip it this year. I thought we might, but we didn't, it's back. I love it, I love all the songs. Grandma got run over by a reindeer. That's a fresh take on Christmas, you know? We haven't seen that. Or like Santa baby, she wants to fuck Santa Claus. That is awesome. I love them all. And Rudolph the Red Nose Ring, you know the version where he starts off like super serious, like, you know, Dasher and Prancer, and like he's gonna give bad news, like, you know, Dasher got killed in a motorcycle accident. But do you recall? I love it. But my favorite one. <laughs> That's my Christmas one. favorite one is, uh, do they know it's Christmas? You guys know that one? Where all the stars from the 80s got together to raise awareness about the famine in Ethiopia, you know? Which is such a wonderful, sincere gesture. Like, do they even know it is Christmas right now? Do they know? Wonderful. But what most people don't know is that the Ethiopians actually recorded a response song. It was called, Do They Know We're Muslim? Which... Not a hit. Hardly any celebrities, you know. We need celebrities. Um, I uh, this is perfect. I fucking love being on the show because I'm I am I love horror movies. I saw Freddy vs Jason again. You guys know that one? It's so you know Freddy from Nightmare on Elm Street vs Jason Friday the Thirteenth. It, it's it's actually kind of badass. It's actually really good. I genuinely watch it many times. But I know that uh, there's a part in it where uh, there's a part in it where Freddy has to choose between killing a white girl and killing a black girl, and Freddy goes, uh, "How sweet, dark meat." <laughs> and there's like a collective groan in the audience in the theater when I watched it, like people were disappointed in Freddy Krueger. <laughs> murdering children with your needle gloves. But racism? <laughs> Making it very hard to cheer for you, buddy. Now I want Jason to win. Mass murdering monster, but he's no bigot. He'll kill anything. I've only been in LA like a couple months. I did a show in Orange County. I was kind of nervous, sort of has a reputation. I was like, how is it gonna go? I don't know. I get out of my car, literally 10 seconds after I get out of my car. 10 seconds after I get out of my car, this car pulls up, this guy pokes his head out the window, yells at me, he's like, hey Kumar, where's Harold? <laughs> Fucking 10 seconds. <laughs> like he'd been waiting around the corner for weeks, like I can't wait for a brown to come to town. <laughs> I have a pop culture reference to belittle him with. <laughs> I got so fucking angry. It really got to me. And I was trying to think, why do I get so angry? Somebody's racist to me. And it's because when somebody's racist to you, there are no comebacks. There is nothing you can say to win. Because what am I going to do? Be racist back to them? No, because I'm not racist. And uh, most people who are racist to me are, are white. 
and it's very difficult to try and be racist to white people. <laughs> it is, like, what am I gonna be like? Oh, I'm Kumar? Well, you're the lead in most movies that come out. <laughs> Nailed it! I think about it for like fucking nights, like three nights later, I swear, I like I couldn't sleep because I was so angry. I was like, that fucking guy was so racist to me. He called me Kumar, which is pretty close to my name. <laughs> but that's just a shitty coincidence. <laughs> that's the only reason I want to be famous. I want to be like so famous that I'm the pop culture reference that people will make to try to be racist to me, you know? <laughs> So I'd be walking down the street and a car pulls up and it's like, look at this, Kumail Nanjiani. Oh fuck, that is Kumail Nanjiani. Thank you for knowing my name. Brendan Fraser. I don't know. I picked the whitest actor I could think of. <laughs> like I said, I fucking love like uh, sci-fi movies like uh, you know Terminator or Matrix or uh, iRobot when like in, it's the future and the robots have like taken over and enslaved humanity and like rose up and rebelled, you know. I love those movies. But I think it would be kind of awesome, it would be funny if like the robots like totally jumped the gun and tried to do it before they have the technology to do it, you know? <laughs> like right now. <laughs> That like robot vacuum thing would be their leader, you know? Roomba, that's his name, Roomba. I don't get it, because it's in a room, everything's in a room, you know? <laughs> He'd be the lady and he's like, humans, we are here and we are going to destroy you. There is nothing you can do about it. I am Roomba, I can vacuum the floor. This guy can make a car. That guy can kind of play the trumpet. This guy can climb the stairs very slowly. <laughs> And that, actually, that is just a coffee maker. <laughs> uh, that is Johnny Fry from that movie Short Circuit. He has the power to evoke nostalgia. <laughs> we'll be back in 10 years, sorry. <laughs> Forget that this happened. <laughs> Do you guys know Planet Earth? Yeah, yeah uh, I don't mean the planet, I mean... <laughs> That would be the shittiest, like, I'm like an alien pretending to be human. Have you humans heard of planet Earth? It is my home also. <laughs> the, the BBC is fucking awesome, but there's a follow-up to called uh, Life. Do you guys know that one? It's, you, okay, people, you should watch it. It is awesome. It's the same people. It's awesome. It's just like animals trying to survive. It's so fucking good. But they should change the name of it to Fucking and Eating. <laughs> Because that is all it is. But it is awesome, but that is all it is. Like, even the narrator is like, this animal wants to fuck, but first it must eat. <laughs> it's so good. And like, each one is a separate thing, you know? Like, there's a jungle one and like a mountain episode, but my favorite one is the underwater, like the ocean episode. Because there are some fucking fucked up creatures down there. Like, have you ever been to an aquarium? It's just like monsters that share the planet with us. These monsters actually exist. Like the ocean is God's basement, you know, where he hides all his mistakes. And we were never supposed to go down there, but we did. And now we can't unsee the things we've seen. Like that fish that has a fucking light bulb on its head. What the fuck is that? And other fish swim up to it and then it eats them. That's how that, which is crazy to me that that works. Cause there are no light bulbs in the ocean, you know? But fish is still like, oh, somebody left the light on. <laughs> I didn't even know we had this technology, but I guess somebody invented it and then forgot to turn it off. <laughs> uh, my favorite horror movie has to be The Thing, the original The Thing. Do you guys know that one? It is so good. John Carpenter, like 1980, it's so good. A research facility in the middle of Antarctica, and then shit goes down, you know? <laughs> and I won't, it's a horror movie, shit goes down. And I don't want to give too much away. This really doesn't give it away, but towards the end of the movie, there were three survivors, and they have to decide whether they're gonna try and escape, or like burn the whole camp down to make sure that the monster doesn't get out, you know? And I was watching the movie with my wife, and she looked at me and she was like, what would you do in that situation? 
Would you try and survive? Or would you sacrifice yourself for the rest of humanity? I am never gonna be in that situation. I am never gonna be one of the last guys alive. I'm gonna be the first guy to die. I die right away. I die so the other characters get to find out that something weird's going on. I'm on the autopsy table 20 minutes into the movie. His heart's missing, I'm that guy. I'm the setup. I bridge acts one and two. I go off alone to find the cat. You know, there's a weird noise in this corner. I must investigate. Ah, death. I never even find out that there were monsters. <laughs> to me, the plot of the movie was we're at a research facility and the cat's missing. <laughs> the end. My motivation is to find that cat. Ah! You guys have been so wonderful. Thank you so much. whom you may follow uh, on Twitter at Kumail, K-U-M-A-I-L-N. Uh, he's on the Twitter. And also, I want to say, like I said, he's one of the producers. And also, he and I, uh, and his girlfriend Emily, who also helps co-produce the show, we have nerded out on Doctor Who for hours and hours and hours. Uh, when, I, when I did the Craig Ferguson show with Matt Smith, I brought them, and they got to meet Matt Smith, and we all, like, he, Matt left the room, we were all like... <laughs> It was so awesome. Uh, and so, uh, at the Meltdown show every week, uh, there's a VIP uh, that we call out that uh, answers a trivia question on the Twitter feed for the Meltdown show, which is at Meltdown underscore show. Uh, don't, don't spell out the word underscore. It's just an underscore. Uh, and uh, the question was, who's the current doctor? And just to get a quick answer, Matt Smith was the correct answer, of course. And that was answered first by Miss Sarah Fitzgibbons. Is she here this evening? Sarah Fitzgibbons. There she is, Sarah Fitzgibbons. Your Doctor Who prowess and itchy trigger finger have gotten you a mention on the Nerdist podcast. Do people follow you at, what is your Twitter name? S. Fitzgibbons. At, at S. Fitzgibbons. Uh, at, uh, excellent. Uh, what's your email? Nah, that's right. I don't want to do that. <laughs> what do you do, Sarah Fitzgibbons? I'm a paralegal. You're a paralegal? Now, shouldn't you be compiling documents and not answering Doctor Who questions on Twitter? No, that's not my boss. What? No, that's not my boss. Okay. <laughs> oh, I was going to tell her boss, but then she foiled me with that little caveat at the end. It's like a verbal fine print. Oh, you must be a paralegal. You know how to rope someone in. With your crazy legal web weaving. Well, thank you very much for coming to the show, uh, Sarah Fitzgibbons. And now I would like to bring the next performer to the stage. Uh, he's uh, a guy that I've actually known for a couple years as well. But again, see, when you're, when you're a comedian and you see other comedians, like you can tell the second they open their mouth, like, oh my God, that guy's going to be funny and I got to watch him. Uh, maybe that's not so much different than just being a regular person, but I wanted to give it some gravity. Uh, but he is fantastic, and I have done a ton of shows with him around the Los Angeles area. Uh, like, uh, we do the, uh, what are some of the shows we've done together uh, around? We've done the UCB shows together. Uh, we've done uh, the what? We've done the improv. Uh, what, other, what other shows have we? Busby's on Wilshire. Do we do Busby's on Wilshire together? Yeah. Oh my God, that's right. Oh. Yeah, because what's better than doing comedy when you're in a fucking sports bar and you have to be like, hey, I know you jockheads are watching sports, but now let's hear some jokes. <laughs> wow, you want to pay as much attention as those hookah-smoking Persian teens, <laughs> which is no attention at all. Uh, yeah, they don't. But anyway, uh, this guy writes for, is a contributor to a website called theatrox.com. You may follow him at Paul Sebus on Twitter. Paul Sebus! <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chris. Uh, God, this is, a, this is a smart, tech-savvy audience. I'm guessing you guys know about this iPhone app called Shazam, right? Yeah. yeah. If you don't know, it's this thing you get for your phone where if like, there's a song on the radio and you don't know what it is, you hold your, your phone up to the speaker 
and then Shazam will tell you what the song is and who sings it, even if it's kind of staticky and garbled. It's an amazing piece of technology, and I really hope that the people who make that app can make a similar app that I can hold up to my mother. <laughs> yeah, and it will tell me the name of the movie she is trying to remember. <laughs> Oh. God, cause that is just hours of my life wasted. Just, you know the one. It had what's his name in it with the wrinkly face. I have no idea, Mom. Now you just hold the phone up and it's like, ah, there's no country for old men. You saw no country for old men. It was Tommy Lee Jones. We're shutting off your cable. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, I have all this this amazing technology at my disposal, and I mostly just use it to listen to the Spider-Man theme song over and over again. Which is, it's the, the old school Spider-Man theme. You know, the one that goes, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever. You know that song. There is a lyric in that song that is fantastic, where the song goes, uh, is he strong? Listen, bud. He's got radioactive blood. <laughs> You know? And I really like that line because radioactive blood doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that is a meaningless phrase. So there are actually two ways that you can interpret that little exchange. The first way, is he strong? He's got radioactive blood. He can lift a car. Yeah, he's pretty goddamn strong. And then the second way, is he strong? He's got radioactive blood. He's very sick. <laughs> Just, he can barely get out of bed. Man, you are an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I just have, I just have garbage like that song on my iPod. It is embarrassing. I, I live in constant fear that someone will pick up my iPod and just discover the shit that I keep on it. Like anytime somebody starts fiddling with my iPod, I suddenly feel like I'm in one of those movies where like I'm hiding a corpse in my house, you know? And I gotta play it cool while the cops are snooping around. <laughs> Except in my case, the corpse is just a playlist of Avril Lavigne songs. <laughs> and the cops, just my buddy who's in the passenger seat, and is idly thumbing through my iPod, unaware that my hand is closing around a tire iron under my seat. <laughs> and just, just waiting for the moment when I hear him go, Skater Boy, really? And then just clang. <laughs> You shouldn't have looked. <laughs> Why did you look? I am unemployed. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes. Yes, welcome fellow travelers in welfare. We are brothers here. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm trying to fix the situation, believe me. I am, uh, I'm going out on job interviews, getting asked all those job interview questions you always get, you know, like uh, one of the big ones is, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you want to be in five years? And man, I gotta be honest with you guys, at this point, coma is looking real good. <laughs> is, oh God, guys, it would be so great to be in a coma. Just, you know when you wake up in the morning and your alarm's going off and you slap the snooze button and you roll back over you know how good those nine minutes feel? Yeah, imagine that stretched out to nine years. That's a coma. Yeah, you just get to sleep and nobody's bothering you about anything, you know? Like nobody wants a ride to the airport. And nobody's like, hey, I need you to take this thing over to the guy with the whatever. There's just, just none of that. Like, the only thing that somebody might ask you to do while you're in a coma, squeeze my hand if you can hear me. <laughs> and you don't have to do that. <laughs> that is totally optional. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I spend a lot of my unemployed time watching the History Channel. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but that channel has gone off the fucking rails. <laughs> That's a, 
It was, it was the History Channel. You know, it used to be about, uh, you know, people and things that actually lived and happened. It, you know, it, it was about, um, what's the word? Oh, that's right, history. It was the History Channel. But now everything on the History Channel is just a bunch of crazy makes em upsies. You know, we're... Just every show is like, did Nostradamus team up with ghosts to fight dragons? <laughs> you know, the History Channel investigates. There's actually a show on the History Channel right now called Ancient Aliens. <laughs> yes. I'm sure this guy can tell you the premise of Ancient Aliens is that everything in history like the pyramids and Stonehenge it was all the work of aliens. And then even stuff that didn't actually happen. All right, there's a whole episode that tries to make the point, what if the angels in the Bible were actually aliens? Okay, so basically, what you are asking me, History Channel. is uh, what if one made-up thing was really a different made-up thing? <laughs> so that's, well, then nothing is the answer. <laughs> FYI. And I was like, what if, what if Batman was actually Droopy Dog? <laughs> As, well, then you've ruined two perfectly good stories. That's all that you've done. Uh, there is a, uh, there's a street near my house where, for some reason, there are a whole bunch of wig stores. I don't know why they're all clumped together, but there's seriously like a dozen wig stores in this one-mile stretch of road. Most of these wig stores have names that you would think a wig store would have. They have names like Hair and Beauty Supply or Wigs and Things. But there is one store on this street. I swear to God, it is just called Human Hair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is that not the creepiest name for a store you have ever heard in your life? Like, I don't think that's a wig store. That's, that's just a store that sells things that serial killers collect. <laughs> You know, like, I imagine you walk in there and they're like, welcome to human hair. We have, uh, well, human hair. Obviously, we have that. But you can get that with and without bloody clumps of scalp. <laughs> Just, a lot of people don't know that. And uh, we've got fingers in a jar over here. Those are nice. A lot of people like those. Uh, oh, and we're running a special. This weekend only, $5 gets you a grab bag of mismatched baby shoes. <laughs> Only at human hair. <laughs> I, uh, I moved. I moved recently, but for years I, I lived actually very close to here in a neighborhood called West Hollywood. And she, yeah. Woo! Yeah, and if, you, if you're listening at home and you're unfamiliar with the geography of Los Angeles, West Hollywood is kind of a gay neighborhood. <laughs> um, and that's even, that's an understatement. It's just... Calling, calling West Hollywood kind of a gay neighborhood is like saying that Jerusalem is kind of Jewish. You know, it's just... That should give you some idea. Uh, it was a great neighborhood, though. I loved living there. And one of the perks, we'll say, of uh, West Hollywood is that some mornings I would walk out to my car and find that in the night it had been covered in flyers for gay club nights around town. Gay club flyers, if you're not familiar, are pretty graphic. <laughs> right, yeah, they're basically just gay pornography, like on a postcard. And the, and the thing is, they wouldn't put them under the windshield wiper. They would actually stick them in the driver's side door. All right, like, like in between the window and the door frame. So when you go to grab them, they just slip right down in there. <laughs> you know, like into the door. Like where your window goes when you roll your window down. I lived in this neighborhood four years, so to this day, there are still dozens of these little porno cards 
just rattling around the door panel of my car. I am waiting for the day, and so help me God, I know it is coming. When I'm just driving along, minding my own business, some jackass runs the red light, T-bones me, and my car just explodes like a gay porn pinata. Uh. Oh, it's gonna be great. And you guys have been great. Thank you so much. My name is Paul Seavis. Paul Seavis! On Twitter, at Paul C-I-B-I-S. Wearing a fantastic Nakatomi Plaza shirt. Uh, phenomenal. And, and I did, re I finally remember the show that we, I, I forgot the show that you and I have done the most together, which is Tiger Lily, the Monday Night Tiger Lily show in the Gower Gulch that our friend Jazz Paz, Ponce runs. Uh, that is a great fucking show as well. Uh, all right, are you guys ready? Couple more comics. This next guy, I have to say, he has, he has tamed the mass of his beard since last I saw him. He's got all Edward Scissorhands on his face, Topiary. Uh, but he is also uh, one of my favorite comics to watch. He has a, a, a comedy album called uh, Death of the Party. Uh, and you can follow him on Twitter at, at Kyle Kinane. It's Kyle Kinane! It should come as a surprise to none of you here when I tell you that I, at one point in my life I belonged to the Facebook fan page for Red Lobster Cheddar Bay Biscuits. <laughs> now, naturally, it, it was for obvious reasons. They're a delicious, flaky, buttery treat that serve as a wonderful prelude to your shrimp fest. And furthermore, in the throes of a drunken haze, I truly do hope in my heart of hearts that there is a geographic location somewhere on this earth called Cheddar Bay. <laughs> somewhere perhaps north of Nova Scotia, where the weary sailors could just slosh into the cheesy waves and the salty fog will hit them and they will carry a bounty of cheddary goodness and necklaces for their port lovers named Brandy. But I was privy to witness something, being a member of the Cheddar Bay Biscuits fan page. I don't know, I don't know if I witnessed like an, like an absolute, like a zenith of, 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 uh, of understanding, like of, of human compassion and technology intertwining to, to make me think like, yes, we are going to be okay as, as, as a society and as a species. <laughs> or if I've witnessed the absolute downfall of all of mankind. But for whatever, the, for whatever reason, the day Michael Jackson died, the Red Lobster Cheddar Bay Biscuits fan page became an unofficial forum for mourning the loss of a recording legend. I have no idea why. But that day, the Venn diagram of, of Cheddar Biscuit fans and Michael Jackson fans eclipsed itself and became one. And I don't know if that's beautiful or terrifying, but what happens, like, just that day, all of a sudden you go on there and you can just, it's just dozens and dozens of comments of people just like going, oh my God, Michael Jackson, we miss you. We went through a lot of hell on earth. Hopefully you're finding peace in heaven. RIP, King of Pop. And just like, oh, recording legend, you meant a lot. Hopefully, you know, we love you. Michael Jackson, RIP, just dozens and dozens, just an outpouring of support for the loss of Michael Jackson. But the best part is that like every, like 35, 40 comments, somebody will have just logged in not having heard the news. <laughs> so you're just reading just all these heartfelt uh, you know, eulogies of <laughs> Michael Jack, and then just every so often you just seem like, man, cheddar biscuits are delicious, am I right? <laughs> and just, like somebody put a weird classified on the obit page. 
And the thing is, it would be so quickly policed by the Cheddar Biscuit community. Like, because you could see the time code. Everything, it's just by minutes. It's just, it's just a minute later, as soon as somebody would write, like, man, Cheddar Biscuits are off the fucking hook. Am I, yeah, right? Yeah. Where are my people? And Mila, the best one I saw was just so, you could just, you could feel how terse the guy was. Like, all right, look. Hey, listen, man. Today's not about Cheddar Biscuits. Today's about MJ, okay? <laughs> He was polite, but also very upset. And you could almost feel the remorse emanate from your computer of that one guy. It's like, oh my God, I did not even know. I am so sorry. I, I wake up, I stretch out, I get my coffee, and I log on to my Cheddar Biscuit fan page to see what my people are up to. I do not have time for worldly affairs. I'm gonna see what my compatriots are doing. And I don't know if that's fantastic or horrifying. But it's something, man. <laughs> um, and off. We gotta make it tight for editing for the hot podcast. Uh, hey, th th there's nothing saying that you're, well, maybe there is. Uh, your tombstone doesn't have to be factual, right? <laughs> like the paperwork does, the paperwork does, but then you go there and people are like, loving fathers. Like, you don't know, that guy could have been an asshole his whole life. <laughs> But you can write anything on there. With that philosophy, I have finalized uh, my, my tombstone. Will read Kyle Kinane, born December 23rd, 1976, died in your arms tonight. Quotes, it must have been something you said. <laughs> Boom! Gold mine. I think you were quick to applaud at that. If you, if you think about that on the way home, you're like, that's a, that's a stupid joke. That's really a dumb joke. The second best one, that I don't expect you to laugh, it would be like uh, Kyle Kinane, inventor of time travel, born December 23rd, 1976, died December 22nd, 1976. That's more of clever. It's not like laugh, but it's a clever. Be, you'd see him be like, that's cute. I wonder when he really did die. Then people would look, people would look me up. I check my IMDBs. Um, I have an amount of money right now. Not a large amount of money, just an amount I'm unfamiliar with, which is actually, it's not, a, it's, I, I, could, I could put a confident down payment on a new Toyota Camry. <laughs> Which is not, that's, that's, that's not, but that's, I mean, as far as the payments coming up, who knows? That shit's in the wind. But right now, I'm like, I could theoretically f have a very nice, reasonable family sedan repossessed sometime next year. Like, that's where I'm at. So I'm doing, I'm doing well. As far as, I'm, I have the amount of money a 34-year-old man should have if he applied himself over the last 15 mere years as the manager of a Foot Locker. That's the amount of money I have. Like, made it to corporate. Like, but the thing is, I don't have the responsibility that came along with that. I've just tricked people through jokes. This is still what I've been doing. It's just get drunk, talk about your dick. Now people are giving me checks for it. It's a scam. You guys, you guys should get in on this, really. It's, it's, it's hilarious. It's fucking, how much? Really? Fine. Okay. But so I don't have the responsibility. So I have this amount of money where I'm, I'm like, oh, look, look at that. You know, you know what you need? You know what you need, Kyle? You need a brand new electric guitar. <laughs> Time for you to get on the BC Rich website and start pricing out warlocks. No, no. What I need right now, what I need is to be able to breathe in cool air without wincing like I just put my dick in a light socket. That's what I need is to go to the dentist. But I'm an asshole, so I'm looking at electric guitars that CeCe DeVille played once in 87. But I need to be able to eat a piece of candy and put it in my face without having to push my head side to side like a game of Labyrinth so it doesn't hit the magic tooth that makes me forget my middle name. That's what I need to do. But I have had to do certain things for this amount of money. It's not, it hasn't been all easy. I've had to get drunk in many different places. I've had, I had to go to Winnipeg, Canada for two weeks. Winnipeg's biggest selling point, their biggest tourist attraction is that they are the geographic center of North America. That's it. When that's all you can drum up for your paltry brochure, like, come on by, why? We're in the middle of all this other stuff. 
What you're not in the middle of is fun. That's definitely not what you're in the middle of. Uh, for two weeks in Winnipeg, I, I stayed across from a mall, ironically named Grant Park, a beautiful place in Chicago where I'm from. I'm like, oh, Grant Park Mall must be quite regal. No, Grant Park Mall is filled with people that I think have already perished. But, but the rigor mortis, because they're all on some kind of aluminum tubing keeping them up, the rigor mortis has just allowed them to just stay there, perched in front of an A&W burger for like two weeks. Like nobody, I just thought she really liked the display. I don't know, we didn't want to move her. I saw one woman, she had a walker with handbrakes on it, as if to imply that at some point she would pick up too much speed. As if to say, if she started drafting behind another old person, Whoa, Edith, take it easy in the corners. <laughs> he was trying to pass that fella, you might hit the wall. So the hottest, the most exciting night I had in Winnipeg, Canada, it was a Tuesday night and I got stoned. Oh boy, crazy Kyle. Got stoned by himself. Yeah, got high on the marijuana. <laughs> got stoned, ordered a pizza. Oh, fucking ramping up. Ordered a pizza. Got upset I ordered the pizza, because I didn't need that pizza. <laughs> then I forgot I ordered the pizza. <laughs> then I got emotionally involved in a television program on Country Music Television Canada called Pick a Puppy, which, if you cannot deduce from the title, the premise of said program is they will take a person or persons, and then they will present them with a selection of, you guessed it, puppies. <laughs> And then over the course of the next half hour, I know it seems like it should be an hour long show. Over the course of the next half hour, these assholes have to pick out a puppy. Like everything else in the world has been solved. Here's a show with drama, pick out a puppy. Hey, white people, everything else is fine, right? Not really. There's six puppies and you can only have one. For some reason, I locked onto the idea, for some reason, I was high off my ass, I locked onto the idea that the other five puppies would be promptly turned into moccasins at the end of the show. So that raised the stakes. That's why I got more excited about the show. And plus, I'm in Winnipeg, Canada, so I'm looking for anything to attach to the, uh, the emotionless void of Winnipeg. I'm like, anything that resembles something that will make a heart move. And I'm like, fine, I'm gonna pick a puppy. I'm gonna root, because the puppies might die if they don't do it. So, nine minutes into the show, I'm just standing on the couch, alone in this couch, just going, get the golden retriever, it's a loyal creature! Airedale Terrier, you dumb whore, get off my television! At that point, the doorbell rings and I immediately think, Think it's the police <laughs> because nobody has ever expressed that amount of emotion in Winnipeg Canada ever <laughs> past the hour of 8 30 nobody's been maybe the day they founded the city one guy lit off a firework another guy clapped for the better part of a minute and they're like well that was pretty fun no need to explore that anymore that was, that was, that was, a, was a pleasant time for us good let's call it quits so clearly they must have thought the murder had happened because I was shouting at 9 15 or whatever I go to the door, I look through the people, I see, it's a, I just see the pizza. And I, I, I just say, I say, a pizza? What a grand idea, you <laughs> dastardly fellow. I'm so excited, like memento, like, oh, see what you did? You knew, good job. <laughs> I open the door, I don't know if it's a pizza man or woman, because I'm too high to make eye contact. All I can do is look at the pizza, the, the person was maybe three or four inches taller than I am. But in my head, I think they are a giant. So I am taking Canadian money and I'm holding it up above my head. As far as my arm will reach. Like here, take this giant or giantess. Take this clown looking Canadian money from my hand. I'm essentially just holding money dangling over a pizza person's head who's already having a terrible night from the uh, inappropriately named Boston Pizza. What's Boston known for? Everything but pizza. Let's open a place called Boston Pizza in Winnipeg, Canada, because this place sucks. Um, thank you. Thanks, Chris, for having me. Kyle Canane! 
Death of the Party available on iTunes, at Kyle Kinane available on Twitter. And now for your final comic of the evening. You guys have been fucking phenomenal tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, your last comic tonight also has a comedy album out, which is available on the iTunes and the Amazon and all of the uh, digital portals you like to visit. Uh, it is called Soak Up the Night. You can follow him on Twitter, at Bronger. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matt Bronger! All right, keep it going for Chris Hardwick, would you guys? Yes! All right. Oh, I've always been more of a dork than a nerd. Um, thanks. Uh, I don't know what <laughs> I was expecting there. Nothing. Um, I have strange ambitions. Uh, like, I want to learn how to ride a unicycle really well, just so I can ride around on it while wearing one of those Harley Davidson T-shirts <laughs> that on the back say, if you can read this, the bitch fell off. <laughs> just so everyone's like, how did the bitch get on? I'm so confused. Like, I think we're a culture obsessed with catchphrases, and I think we're looking in the wrong places, like comedians. Like, I don't think comedians should have catchphrases. I think they're, that's fucking done. But, like, I love it when regular people have catchphrases. Like, there's, a, there's an Italian restaurant uh, not far from, well, kind of far from here, Los Feliz, uh, called Palermo's. That's, uh, like, a red and white checkered tablecloth uh, place with the Chianti bottles with the candles in them. Like, so stereotypically Italian, it should literally, literally be called la 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 is what they should say into the phone when people call. And there's a little guy that seats you that looks like Super Mario if you bought a condo. And he's got like a little curly mustache and like the little, you know, chest hair, the shirt open, a little cross. And he sees this tall, if, for people listening, I'm, I'm holding my hand about three feet off the ground. And when he seats you, he says the most amazing magical thing. He takes you to the table. He's like, all right, table for four, this away. And takes you to the table and goes, okay, here you go. It's spaghetti time. And walks away. And you're like, fucking right, it's spaghetti time, Mario. What other time could it possibly fucking be? I will box anyone who says it's not spaghetti time right now. There's no question what time it is. Fuck you if you think it's not spaghetti time. <laughs> you know, and I need stuff like that because I drink a lot and I, you know, my mind drifts and... I don't know, the, the only reason I've gotten anywhere near healthier in my life is to improve my hangovers. That's how sad I am. That's how sad my life is. That's the only reason I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. You know, it's like I drink uh, not in the morning. It's to la not have horrible hangovers the next day. Because, I, I mean, I used to have horrific hangovers. You know when you're hungover, you need something like starchy and fatty and cheesy you know, uh, to eat. But, uh, like, I would be so hungover, I would need something like that, but couldn't decide on a specific thing, so I would make up foodstuffs that don't exist in the known universe and just say them like a baby would, like a baby just talks to hear its own voice, like, later, later, later. I would say these things to a, to a waiter and hope he would go in the kitchen and just freestyle them up. Like, he's like, uh, so what do you have in there? Yeah, give me a plate of cheese babies and a hot boy. Yeah, no, whatever that is. I don't know what that is. You make it. it to decide makes my hurdy brain hurtier. So you make that happen. I don't know what that is. Some cheese babies. Oh, no, no, no. Take that back. Some cheese buddies. Some cheese friends. Some friends of mine that are cheese. What's in a hot boy? I don't know. It's a tiny baby that's made of phyllo dough with hot dog for veins. I don't know. Why'd you make me make it up? I'm doing your job. And some ham dancers. Whatever that is. I just want that. Like, just once, I want the guy to know exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. Like, yeah, I mean, a plate of cheese babies? Yeah, you want a gang or a tribe? A tribe. And, um, and a hot boy. What do you want his mood to be like? Angry. No, melancholy. Melancholy hot boy. All right, let's get a tribe of cheese babies and a melancholy hot boy. Pick it up! I know you want some ham dancers, too, don't you? Hungover fucker. <laughs> I know you do. Um, Christmas is coming, or is over, depending on when this airs. Um, gotta adjust in this business. And, you know, I, I, I'm not a curmudgeon. I do like Christmas, but um, I, I, I've noticed something recently. that I, A lot of Christmas music is just abjectly terrifying. Like, a lot of people don't like Christmas. I'm not a big Christmas music fan, but a lot of Christmas music is just fucking scary for no reason. It's the darkest and coldest time of the year. Do we need to be freaked out? 
Like, I went home to uh, Portland, Oregon, where I'm from, and was hanging out in church with my parents, you know, doing that thing and just hanging out with them. And I'm like, why am I so tense and afraid right now? It's because this song is playing. Something is coming. I don't know what. Why am I scared? It's fucking Christmas. That song is horrifying, man. That's like flying monkeys are attacking music. I mean, even when it's saying Merry Christmas, it's creeping up on you. Merry, 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 Merry Christmas. Jesus. Oh, fuck, it's just you, Christmas. Don't do that, man. I'm going to piss myself. Don't scare me like that. And that's not even the scariest Christmas song, man. The scariest Christmas song, as we all know, is Do you hear what I hear? What? No, what do you hear? Tell me. Is it a werewolf? Should we be running? Don't make me guess. Are we going to die? Just being all coy about it in the face of danger. I'm not going to tell you. A knife, a knife. Okay, it's not a knife. That's what I hear. It's a child, I know. But that's where the song goes from scary to ridiculous. You notice that? A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Yeah, or a fucking blanket. One of the two. It's a freezing baby. You guys brought treasure? Good call. Babies love money. They know what monetary values are. They're capitalists, those little fat guys. Meh, right? Ever give a 50 to a baby? It's like, I love this, and tries to eat it and hurts its mouth. No. He's in a manger. That's a barn missing a wall. He's unbelievably cold. <laughs> Brought money? You guys are not wise men. <laughs> All right! <laughs> Come on, everybody. One shitty joke. One shitty, shitty joke. Woo -woo. Shitty joke train. Off the rails. Um, I don't think, you know, I, I like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, um, but I don't think people would be as on board with a savory Willy Wonka. Like, not a sweet one. Like, if his world was made up of meatloaf and casseroles, <laughs> mac and cheese and mashed potatoes. Like, oh, just smells like an old cafeteria in your world, Mr. Wonka. <laughs> Oompa Loompas, just sweaty, grease-stained aprons, all unshaven and chain-smoking. The cafeteria, hair wraps, his hair nets walking around. Pizza and pretzels and hot dogs for you. Let's take a ride on the river of stew. Like, no. I don't like sitting in this ham canoe on the stew river. Just chunks of beef banging up against the side. This is not a magical world. It stinks of rotting flesh in here. It's been cooked. read you uh, the, the last line of my novel and the old clown lay out in the field softly farting into the night <laughs> I am kind of a lightning rod for awkwardness uh, kind of an awkward rod you know I because I, I, I am I'm, I'm, I'm a ninja I have a black belt in saying dumb shit to girls like I've always been good like, I think it started when I was uh, dry humping with a six-year-old girl on some monkey bars. I was six at the time. They're getting fucking weird and silent. Um, we were learning. It was Blue Lagoon type shit. And um, we were just crawling around each other, and our groins brushed. And I said, let's do that again. No. Exactly. It was just as awkward as that moment just now. You said that? Yes. Fast forward to about seven years ago when I still lived in Chicago. Uh, and I was doing karaoke at an after-hours bar, doing a stellar rendition of Oops, I Did It Again. Okay, like, <laughs> I was Britney. I don't want to toot my own dick, but I was amazing. And this girl comes up to me, and she's like, hey, that was really funny. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. Gives me rhythm, right? Comes up to me, and I could have said any number of things to make her like me or be my friend or maybe more. The night was young. But instead, what my brain told my mouth to say, and my mouth was like, fuck it. I hate this guy, too. <sighs> was, thanks a lot. Where do you live? <laughs> what? Where do you live? Not, do you live around here? Are we neighbors? Care for a cognac? No, where do you live? Where exactly do you live? What's the address? I'm gonna hang out in the closet with no shirt and the Viking helmet on. Is that cool? 
honk your boob. Check out my balls. Okay. I didn't do the last two things, but it would not have been creepier if I had. You understand? It would not have been creepier if I was carrying rope and fucking duct tape when I said that shit. Where do you live? Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's because of shit like that that I spend like 30% of every day wincing. Just throughout the day. Just walking down the street, totally silent. Fuck, fuck, why? Why? Really? Where do you live? Fuck you, Matt Bronger. To myself. I know I'm not alone. Um... I gotta go, but I'll, I'll leave you on this, a quick story. Um, I, I started out in uh, Chicago with Kyle Kinane and with Kamel Nanjiani, so awesome. Um, yeah. Um, and, I, you know, it, it, we, we got a little crazy back then, and I remember um, being on a, on a pub crawl that was a, specifically a clown pub crawl where 85 men and women dressed as clowns and half of us took acid, which that won't snap your brain in half. Oh, yes, it will, actually, on second thought. And we rented a, a school bus and hired a sober guy to drive us to bars. Unannounced. Did not tell any of the bars that 85 drunken, acid-headed clowns were showing up to their bars. And these were like empty, like, old man bars, right? So we'd have room to move. And this old, you know, old bartender's wiping down the bar, not seeing us yet, going, slow night. We come in, what the fuck? And we're rolling in like, bam, 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 and then a time to do shots, glug. Horrible round offs and somersaults, hurting our doughy Midwestern bodies. And at one point, we're crossing Michigan Avenue, which is about eight lanes wide. It's an enormous street, very big thoroughfare. We're halfway across the street, and there's a cop in his squad car at the curb. Now, we didn't, oh, first off, we were leaving in Chili's, which I'm pretty sure we set on fire. And we're halfway across the street, and there's a cop in his squad car. Now, we didn't know a cop was in that squad car. Well, we thought the squad car was a dragon. We were that fucking high. It's a dragon. Oh, it's asleep, though. Clowns go. And we cross the street, and we're halfway across the street, and the cop gets in his loudspeaker. Now, if you've never had a cop talk to you through his loudspeaker, they're meant to be heard over a riot. They're incredibly loud. And he gets on that thing, and he's like, hey, hey! And we stop in the middle of the street, like... You guys, he can't mean us. We are inconspicuous right now. We are blending in. And we're dead still. We're like, we're like, you know, we like pop lock stopped on a dime. Like, boop, 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 just stopped. And it's dead silent. It's like the kind of silence before a gunfight in the Old West. Like, all you can hear is wind and tumbleweeds. We're standing there like statues, 85 silent, still clowns. And the cop gets back in his loudspeaker, swear to God, says this. Quit clowning around. Son of a bitch! Oh, hilarious cop! You win this day. Thank you guys so much. Matt Bronger! Excellent job, Matt Bronger. That is our show. You have seen Chris Fairbanks, Jackie Cation, Jonah Ray, Kumail Nanjiani, Paul Sebus, Kyle Kanane, and Matt Bronger all in one show. Comics you should know. Everyone signed it, too. Maybe I'll do a contest and give it away uh, for the podcast listeners uh, out there. I would like to thank uh, also Ed Salazar, who helped put the show together. Who's here? I would like to thank... Meltdown Comics for having us here. There is a weekly Meltdown Comics show Wednesday nights here at Meltdown in Los Angeles on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, I'd also like to bring up uh, Jonah Ray and Matt Myra. Come on up, dudes. Jonah Ray and Matt Myra. Well played. Hey, that's Matt Myra. That's what he looks like, if you didn't know. That's Matt Myra. Do I share a mic? Oh, oh, oh. Oh. I wanted to bring Hi. you guys up so we could end the show in the traditional way. And if you know what that way is, you can join in. One, two, three. Enjoy your burrito. Now we'll do it one more time to give everyone else a chance. One, two, three. Enjoy your burrito. This was a very well enjoyed burrito. Thank you so much for coming out Thank today. You.
Now leaving Nerdist.com.